coming, which would be going to the moon, ultimately setting up lunar colonies, manufacturing in space things that we could not do successfully here in the uh, the 1G gravity of, of planet Earth. And, of course, that other thing, which was very seldom mentioned, but was there nonetheless, a military presence on the moon. Now, granted, we spent untold billions of dollars to get there. The Soviet Union at that time, in a neck-to-neck race with us, spent untold billions of rubles to get there. On July the 20th, 1969, a date that will forever live in my memory, we touched down, and we thought that was the beginning. But, unfortunately, it was not. We ended up going up there about seven times, landed successfully only six And in December of 1972, also another date that will live in my memory, we returned from the moon for the very last time. Now, what was really surprising about that? Number one, there was never really any explanation from NASA on why we stopped going to the moon, other than, well, you know, the American public just doesn't seem to, to care much anymore. And, uh, you know, they don't care. Uh, we're, we're just going to kind of call it off. Even though we had already built additional Saturn rockets to go back up there. We had astronauts trained. We had all the equipment sitting on the launch pad ready to go. All they needed to do was light the candle. Never Happened. Then the rumors started, perhaps, just perhaps, we were warned off the moon. And I think that's a, that's a great place to stop right now, Gene. There's a movie coming out later this year called Apollo 18. And I guess this is a kind of a horror film in the tradition of Blair Witch Project, where it kind of has a semi-documentary feel, where they present a lunar landing where we are warned off by E.T. Is that what it's about? Yeah, you see, this is one of the the things that uh, in all my years of, of lunar research, and I, I went back starting at the very beginning. In 1976, a tremendously powerful, important book was published that was almost gone as quickly as it hit the bookshelves titled Somebody Else Was on the Moon by uh, an author by the name of George Leonard. Now, Leonard was an American scientist, had friends and associates that were working within the Apollo program. After Apollo was canceled, he was in contact with some of these people, was able to enter NASA and see a lot of the photographs that they had taken, which at that time, for the most part, were totally unknown to the American public, ended up writing this book, and in it, he also published a number of photographs that were breathtaking in, the, in what they showed, what they seemed to show, I guess I should say, and what the implications were if his interpretation of what he was seeing was correct. And that was, in essence, and let me just distill it for you, that there was, and perhaps still is, an extraterrestrial presence, particularly on the far side of the moon, the the surface, the part of the moon that we never see, and that apparently this facility has been in operation a very long time. Now, over the years, there have been a lot of things that have eventually surfaced to suggest that perhaps there is something there. Now, of course, NASA has spent its career in denying reports like this, denying reports that we were, quote, unquote, warned off the moon. But there have been tremendous questions that have been asked that have never been answered by anybody within NASA. And during that period of time, I have also collected quite a large library of photographs that most of the public are also not aware of that seem to show that there are mechanical devices up there, some gigantic in scope, that uh, suggest that somebody has uh, a presence that's been up there a long time. 
David Hatcher Childress, what attracted you as someone who has explored mysteries on the Earth to the prospects, the promise of what might be going on on the moon? Well, yeah, I, uh, just like Don, uh, I, he's older than me, but yeah, I remember watching all uh, the NASA Apollo missions and all that. And I remember, uh, and I have the books, I knew uh, George Leonard, uh, who wrote Somebody Else's on the Moon. And that book was followed uh, by a couple of other books um, by a guy named, um, his name was Don Wilson. And he wrote two books that also appeared in the 70s called uh, Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon. And then there was a, sequ- another, a sequel called uh, Secrets of Our Spaceship Moon. And that book, unlike Leonard's books book, uh, which was a hardback and then it was a paperback, that did have some photos, as Don said, but uh, and, and some drawings that Leonard had done. And uh, it had maybe 10 photos in it or something. And, and Don Wilson's books had no photos in it at all. But it was much the same theory uh, that the, the moon is occupied. Uh, it's actually some kind of artificial spaceship, even. And uh, that there, of course, are all these anomalies. There's pyramids on the moon. There are dome cities. Uh, there are these, like, moving uh, rovers that are moving on the, on the moon. Leonard believed that there were these also these, what he called these, these X drones, these giant uh, mining drones that were moving along on the moon. I mean, I'll tell you what, we'll get into the promise, possibly the threat of what's going on on the moon with David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> I've got to tell you about this. GoToMeeting by Citrix, the way I meet online with my colleagues, has just added high-definition group video conferencing. It's called GoToMeeting with HD Faces. Now you can collaborate with anyone around the world face-to-face. And I've used GoToMeeting HD Faces because it's awesome. You see the facial expressions, and that can express so much more than words. Of course, the video quality is so clear and natural, it's got the highest resolution in the industry. Nothing compares. GoToMeeting Meeting with HD Faces will make your online meetings even more personal, engaging, and effective. Plus, it's so easy to use. All you need is an internet connection and a webcam. I want you to try GoToMeeting with HD Faces. My listeners can try it free for 30 days. Visit GoToMeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button. Use the promo code PODCAST. The promo code is PODCAST at GoToMeeting.com. Alan Olson with Midas Resources, senior gold and silver broker since 1978. Over the last 3,000 years, gold has been a storehouse of wealth and has survived nearly 500 paper fiat currencies. Since the 1970s, the fiat U.S. paper dollar has lost over 90% of its purchasing power and is decreasing every day. With the U.S. government that is bent on reckless spending, gold and silver are your only safe havens of protection for your hard-earned paper dollars. Please contact me, Alan Olson, at 1-800-686-2237, extension 127, with your questions or purchases. Let's work together to preserve your assets. 1-800-686-2237, extension 127. Again, 1-800-686-2237, extension 127. Are you tired of spending money for metal canning lids year after year? Then stop. Stop buying metal lids and get Tatler reusable canning lids. Made of USDA and FDA approved food grade plastic, Tatler canning lids let you safely store emergency preparedness foods for years. Traditional metal lids are single use throwaways that contain BPA, but Tatler canning lids are indefinitely reusable and guaranteed to last a lifetime when used as designed for home canning and contain no BPA. Tatler lids are dishwasher safe, perfect for standard pressure or water bath canning, eliminate food spoilage from acid corrosion fit standard mason jars and are proudly made in the USA. Place orders by phone at 877-747-2793 or go to reusablecanninglids.com. That's 1-877-747-2793 or go to reusablecanninglids.com. That's reusablecanninglids.com. Tatler Reusable Canning Lids, the original since 1976.
Did you know nuclear radiation is still spewing out of the melted down reactors in Fukushima, Japan, and making its way across the entire U.S. continent, contaminating the air, water, and food? Dangerously high levels of radiation are a reality here. As a result, radiation poisoning is a distinct possibility for anyone living in the U.S., unless you do something to protect yourself. How? With Liquid Zeolite from RestoreYourHealthNow.com. Without a doubt, Liquid Zeolite is by far the best product to remove radiation from your body. It safely removes toxins. Toxins and heavy metals, boosts energy levels, and promotes a strong immune system. Liquid Zeolite is so powerful it was used to clean up contamination in Chernobyl, yet so gentle you won't even know you're taking it. Liquid Zeolite comes with a money-back guarantee, but is only available at RestoreYourHealthNow.com. Learn how to get free bottles of Liquid Zeolite by calling 800-880-9976. That's 800-880-9976. Or go to RestoreYourHealthNow.com. That's RestoreYourHealthNow.com. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. We're looking at the moon. Someone else on there? What's going on? What about secret explorations? We continue with Don Ecker and David Hatcher Childress with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. David, you started in explaining some of the things that are happening on the moon as we ended our last segment. Would you continue? Right. And, and there were really these three books from the 70s. Then uh, there, was a, there was a book done in the late 80s called Alien Bases on the Moon. That, that, that book had more photos. And... Uh, Fred Steckling was his name, and he uh, was a German-American who, who worked for NASA. And like George Leonard, he also was able to get his hands on uh, a lot of uh, the Apollo and, and Gemini photo stuff of the moon. As I got really fascinated by it, and I was traveling all over the world at a time, as, as I still do, and I was in Australia and England, and I started collecting books there on the moon. And I found that actually some of the best books of photos and things of the moon were actually these British astronomy books, not, not American books. And those books, too, also had a lot of the Soviet uh, Zond photos of the moon. And the more that I poured over all those photos, I mean, I became fascinated. And ultimately, I released uh, a book, which has now been in three different editions, called Extraterrestrial Archaeology. That book, I sought to put all this information from George Leonard's books and Don Wilson and Fred Steckling's and others, the Soviet photos, there's what's called the Blair Cuspids on the moon, which are these obelisks there, and put them together in a large format book where people could really see these photos, uh, black and white, in a large format and look at them themselves. And as I assembled that book, I became astonished myself at all of the anomalistic uh, structures on the moon where you can clearly see these things are uh, our pyramids. There's the crater Aristillus on the moon. And in the middle of that uh, crater, like seven pyramids. And you, you see them clearly in the photos. Now, NASA would say, oh, yeah, well, you know, they're, they look like pyramids, but they're not really artificial pyramids or something. There just happen to be these mountains in the moon. But yeah, they look like perfect pyramids. But then when you ask them, and it, it's more difficult for them to explain things that are moving on the moon and leaving tracks behind them. They're like those, like in Star Wars, those big uh, vehicles that are moving around through these desert planets or something. And they're, the, they're factories themselves that are moving around. And NASA was, took photographs of these things. And you can see the tracks that are made from them. NASA then also said, well, uh, oh, well, those are just rocks rolling around on the moon. And uh, that, that earthquakes shake these big rocks off of, of hills and stuff, and then they roll down the hill and leave these tracks. But in one case, the 
the tracks of this this thing, this rock or or machine that's that's actually moving on the moon, it actually comes up out of a crater and then goes down the other side. So how can it be? How could it just be rolling around on the moon? It doesn't make sense. That's amazing. And David is David is absolutely correct about. Um, when I really became interested in questions about activity that was basically inexplicable on the moon started back in the very early 1990s. Now at that time, I was the director of research for UFO magazine. And I had a radio program that aired once a week on CRN called UFOs Tonight. And during one of those broadcasts, uh, as it turned out, one of my listeners got in touch with me, a fellow by the name of Jim Sylvan. And Jim had been studying questions about lunar phenomena. And as a matter of fact, lived out here on the West Coast and had started a side business where he was making some of these lunar photographs available to the public. And he had contacted me because he had heard one show where I had a guy on there, and we were discussing some of these lunar inexplicable events and send, ended up sending me a package of photographs. Now, when I received those and I started going through those, some of those photographs, in fact, showed, for example, what David just mentioned, about rolling objects on the surface of the moon. Now, that was one of the most, at that time, breathtaking uh, photographs that I had seen. Now, I had seen a very small representation of this in Leonard's book. I had the paperback copy of the book. And for any of you guys that have seen that book, and you know that especially the paperback version was uh, really not that great when it came to some of these photos. But having the actual photograph uh, was something entirely different. So I got in touch with Jim and ended up inviting him to come on the program. And we did the first of several uh, broadcasts on my show with, with Jim Sylvan where we discussed some of this stuff. Now, at the time, Jim told me, that he had been studying this at that time probably 10 or 12 years, and that he was fairly convinced that whatever was going on up there was certainly by no human agency. Now, I began to do some research on that. In 1990, I believe it was 95, I finally was able to secure a interview with a guy by the name of Vito Sicari, who was a petroleum engineer based down in Houston, Texas. He came on my program, and basically I had one of the most astounding broadcasts I think I ever had in my entire career. Now, what basically Sakari told me was that back in the late 1970s, actually about 1979, his company was working in connection with an American firm based down in Venezuela. And one of those engineers, for whatever reason, was coming up to the States, and his firm asked Vito if he would uh, basically shepherd this guy around for several weeks, that he was going to be in town. And uh, they had become friends uh, over a period of time through their electronic communications back then. This guy's name was Lester Howes, and when Lester got up there, one of the first things he did after they actually met face-to-face -face for the first time was reach into his pocket, pull out a copy of Leonard's book. He handed it to Vito and said, do me a favor, go home tonight, read this, and then I want to talk to you about it tomorrow. So Sakari did. The next day when he came back to work and they met, he was kind of blown away by what he had read in Leonard's book, which discussed a lot of these anomalous events. So what Lester wanted to do on his time up there was to go over to NASA in Houston and basically see these photographs. Well, little did they know about the three-week odyssey they were about to undertake. When they went over to see what they thought were these publicly funded, publicly available lunar photographs, 
Now, for anybody that heard that show, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm but going to ask yeah. you something about that in a moment, Don Ecker. We have Don Ecker. We have publisher, author, David Hatcher Childress. You're listening to The Paracast. <laughs> Neighbors, do you need to bring the final touches to your latest podcasts? Clean up the soundtrack of that holiday video. Mix together a few takes from your last jamming session. Process the audio files of the video game you're creating to sound just right. But look no further. Whatever audio-related task you're looking to perform, Amadeus Pro is the tool for you. It's the Swiss Army knife of sound editing. Go to hairersoft.com. H-A-I-R-E-R soft.com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Ready to save? Then you're ready for the Super Summer Sale at Herbal Healer Academy. Herbal Healer has been the leader in quality natural supplements for 23 years. Log on to HerbalHealer.com and take advantage of Herbal Healer Academy's incredible savings on 500 parts per million colloidal silver. The best pharmaceutical grade available at all sizes on sale. Super Male Plex with you Hindi and Super Femplex for summer toning. Buy glucosamine chondroit in 60 caps, summer sale priced at only $12. Colon and answer 250 caps, summer sale priced at just $18. And if your brain's a little foggy, we have a great supplement on sale called Memory Power. Log on and hit the postcard specials link for more super summer savings at HerbalHealer.com. As always, new customers get a free catalog with first order. Herbal Healer Academy, healing the world with nature one person at a time. Before you throw away your used batteries, you need to listen to this. Now, going green can save money. Go green and save money by giving life to your used batteries by charging them with the Renaissance Charger. The Renaissance Charger uses a new revolutionary battery charging technology that effectively extends the life of new batteries and gives new life to used batteries. Invented by legendary audio genius John Bedini, this unique and patented charging system rejuvenates the electrochemical plate structure in the battery without additives, increasing capacity and maintaining cell integrity. Renaissance Charge offers a full line of products made in the USA for all types and sizes of batteries. Find out why our customers tell us the Renaissance Charger is the only battery charger they will ever use. Save your money. Save the environment. Visit us online at r-charge.com. That's r-charge.com. Or call us at 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. Be a part of the revolution today. Fight back this cold and flu season with the world's best garlic extract, Alley C. Why Alley C? Because it helps your body fight viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Alley C has been scientifically proven in double-blind studies using low doses to greatly reduce the number, severity, and duration of common colds. Alley C contains 300 milligrams of stabilized allicin, the active ingredient in crushed garlic. Studies show Alley C is effective against MRSA, bacterial, fungal, and viral infections. One tablet of Alley C has the equivalent of 40 cloves of garlic. Alley C supports your body's resistance to all types of conditions and can help lower high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So boost your body's resistance to infection with nature's best garlic extract, Alley C. For more information and to order Alley C, call 877-888-7126 or go to garlichealthproducts.com. That's 1-877-888-7126 or go to garlichealthproducts.com for your Alley C today. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hi, this is Clifford Cliff, the International Director for the Mutual UFO Network. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. It's all noon all the time with Don Ecker and David Hatchery Childress with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Don, this particular episode that you did 
this lunar discussion. Is that available for download? Is that one of the shows that you have available in our forums? Yes, it's uh, not only in the Dark Matters Radio forum, but it's also in the Dark Matters Radio archives. If you go up to darkmattersradio.com, the very top of the page, it will take you right into the archives. And uh, yes, that uh, that show is available. So it's it's really available in two spots, on the Paracast, the Dark Matters Radio Forum, and on the Dark Matters Archives. One way or the other, you can get yourself a copy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm hanging on my seat here, Don. What? Uh, let's uh, <laughs> listen uh, to like a thumbnail sketch of what uh, their three-week uh, period uh, ended up producing. Well, they went over to NASA. They kind of thought that they would just walk in, say, hi, here we are, we're the taxpayers, and we'd like to see uh, those moon photographs. Well, <laughs> to say at the very least, they were treated like possible Russian agents. They were shuttled from one area to another. They were literally put on a merry-go-round. At one point, they were given a building number. They were not allowed to uh, bring their, their vehicle on uh, the site itself, they had to walk everywhere. And I mean, you know, the NASA facility is pretty darn big. Uh, they were given a building to go to to see these photographs. And there were actually two buildings with that number, one an A and one a B. They went to the first one, and it was basically just an empty hangar, as described by uh, Vito. And uh, they looked and they said, well, gee, maybe this is not the right one. So they went to the other building. They finally found it, walked in, and when they walked in, this was exactly at the time that the NASA Voyager mission was beginning to send back its uh, photographs, its telemetry from, uh, uh, I believe it was, oh, geez, I believe it was Saturn. And they got in there, and they stood around. Nobody knew who these guys were. And uh, all these these NASA technicians were ooing and aahing at all these photographs that were streaming back. They saw these two new guys that had walked in. I guess they thought they were somehow connected with the Voyager mission. And finally, uh, one guy turned to Vito and said, hey, what do you think about that? And he looked at the picture. Oh, yeah, that's great. And Lester, his buddy, walked up and said, yeah, and by the way, how about those moon photos? And suddenly, all these people turned around, and they looked at him, and they started covering up their computer monitors and everything, and uh, they, they called security. Security ended up coming over, and uh, they threatened to arrest them for espionage. And they later figured out that they were sent to this building probably to try to scare them off. Well, this kind of business went on for several weeks until finally they did get to the correct place where these lunar photographs were stored. They went down there, but all the uh, numerical you know, designators on the photographs that they had gotten originally from George Leonard, when the archivist asked them what photographs they were there to see, they gave it to him. He looked at it and said, well, this won't do you any good. And they said, well, why not? Because the, these are the numbers that Leonard used back in uh, the D.C. area. Well, as it turned out, NASA had four geographically different archives for these these lunar photographs. Each archive had a different designator for these photographs. That would be like going to a, a different public library than the one you're used to, and they had a different Dewey Decimal System. Is that a no way sense. then to kind of hide the information so it's not readily obvious that it's there? I would think uh -huh. that, uh, yeah, it is. When they started to kick up a fuss about this, they ended up having to fill out some forms. <laughs> and no, really, sure. I mean, no, I'm just thinking of typical government behavior. 
fill oh, out yeah. a form well, for this. Well, they wanted to know what things like were you or anybody in your family ever a member of the Communist Party? I mean, that kind of stuff. Sure. Just absolutely ludicrous stuff. And they filled all these out. They had to be sent back to wherever. These guys were checked out. Finally, they were given the right designators to see these these photographs. Now, this is after three weeks of going through literally hell to see these public NASA moon photos. The payoff was when they were finally allowed to see them, and they told them which, and it was a series of 40 photographs, the same photographs that Leonard had mentioned in his book. What they ended up seeing, it turned out to be several thousand photographs because whenever the cameras would see something of interest, they would start to shoot photos of it. But then it would zoom in and shoot more photos and then zoom in and shoot more photos. Now, this is something a lot of people were not aware of. But they had basically some extreme close-ups, stuff that has never been made available to the American public. And these photographs, now, of course, by this time, my, my bottom line was, okay, Vito, what did you guys see? I mean, you know, uh, this is a hell of a story. It's really fascinating. It's even been funny. But what's the bottom line? He said, Don, he said, we saw construction. He said we saw what looked like massive pipes, the things that Leonard referred to as extrones. We saw those. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. Did you see anything that could faintly even be described as an unidentified flying object, a UFO, what you thought might have been some type of extraterrestrial craft? And he said, Yes. So what's the bottom line, Vito? He said there was a presence up there. He said, and I think not only is uh, that the reason they were so adamant about people not seeing this stuff, but the majority of photographs that have been released over the years have been incredibly low resolution. So to prove that very point was that Lester wanted to know, his friend wanted to know if any of these photographs could be purchased by the public. And they said yes. So Vito's company ended up springing for him to buy some of these photographs. And it took a number of weeks for them to be made ready. And when they were ready and they were received, they were all incredibly low-resolution photographs with a lot of the detail muddied out. Now, for anybody that's ever looked at a lot of lunar photographs, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I say they were muddied out. Now, one of the things that I hope we get a chance to discuss later in the program is the fact that many years later, in 1994, in fact, we did go back to the moon. But not NASA, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, or Department of Defense in connection with NASA, went back to the moon with the Clementine Project. And that in itself is a hell of a story. I can see where it is. We're going to look also at the questions pro and con about the photographs, about the evidence, and what the heck is going on with our space program. Why have we cut back if there's any evidence of activity on the moon from them we have don ecker he hosted the dark matters radio show we still do gene is it back on yet or well it's running every night i'm i have not yet released any new uh, shows in a while okay it's running monday through friday on cyber station usa very good we have david hatcher childress author and publisher I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then... A coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack! Attack! 
of the Rockoids. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack of the Rockoids, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. Local Army Navy surplus stores are hard to find these days, but not military issue supplies. They're right here online at mainmilitary.com. That's right, just like the state, M-A-I-N-E, military.com. We have everything for true, total preparedness. MainMilitary.com is not a typical website. It has much more than your old surplus store. Quality military-issue survival gear like canteens, mess kits, utensils, gas masks, filters, and chemical suits, magnesium fire-starting tools, strike anywhere, waterproof, and storm matches, first aid kits, splints, tourniquets, parachute 550 cord, military manuals, sandbags by the bail, and a huge Molly assortment of vests and pouches for every need. Call 207-989-6783, 207-989-6783, or visit MainMilitary.com. That's M-A-I-N-E, Military.com, the main name in military supply. OpticsPlanet.com is where discerning gun owners and outdoorsmen go to gear up. Optics Planet has the best selection of rifle scopes, red dots, night vision, holsters, bags, and tactical gear on the planet. With always low prices, free shipping on most orders, and expert customer service. Go to OpticsPlanet.com slash GCN to get a free gift with purchase. That's OpticsPlanet.com slash GCN. Or call 800-332-OPTICS. 800-332-6784. Democrat. Democrats, Republicans, have you had enough? Want real change? Then change yourself. Join a new political party formed to liberate the American people from the banksters who have overthrown the republic. If you agree with maximum liberty, limited government, and traditional morality, then you agree with American third position. Get more information now. Call 800-513-4928 or go to a3p.me. That's A, the number 3, p.me. It's time to take America back. Energy, energy, and more energy. We all need it. Get the energy you need quick through the powers of wild forest extract. Wild chaga and birch bark are the secrets of the forest used exclusively by Russian athletes. Wild chaga is the world's top source of superoxide dismutase, the critical enzyme that blocks the aging process. Chaga is good for your heart and even helps support healthy arteries. Wild birch extract is the top source of betulin, a natural sterile needed by every cell of the body. And healthy cells mean a healthy body and a more powerful you. No wonder it's known as a king of all herbs. Experience real energy and power like you've never dreamed possible. Take Chago Charge Tea with Wild Birch Bark every day and Chaga Max capsules to get the energy you need. You deserve it. Order today by calling 877-817-9829. 877-817-9829. That's 877-817-9829. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. This is Paul Bannister. I'm the author of Tabloid Man, the Baffling Chair of Death. You're in the Paracast. And now I'm on the show because the Queen herself asked me to do it. She knows, well, she told me. The Paracast is the gold standard of paranormal broadcasting. Listen and be spooked. I guess Chris and I can be flies on the wall here, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think we're, we're, we're kind of uh, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Uh, Don made a very interesting post uh, a couple of days ago on the forum that... A, is a, just a fascinating list of transient lunar phenomena. And David, you're pretty up to speed on the history of anomalies on the moon. Ever since the, the development and invention of the telescope, pretty much strange things have been seen, flashes of light, objects seeming to transit across the, uh, the face of the moon. Do you want to talk about some of the histories uh, that we have of uh, these uh, strange uh, sites that are seen by astronomers? Well, sure. Uh, early astronomers, with I mean, yeah, once they developed telescopes and things, even before that, 
they were seeing all kinds of stuff on the moon. They thought they saw cities. Uh, they thought they saw structures on the moon. Uh, there's what they called uh, the crater Gassendi. They also started seeing light uh, on the moon. Um, people started drawing various things. The crater Darwin was thought to be changing all the time, like somebody was digging it out and stuff like that. Uh, early on, they, you know, they, they pinpointed several uh, places on the moon, on, on the face that we can see, and certain craters like Ascendi were particularly known for having this uh, transient uh, lunar light phenomenon moving across it, and people were constantly seeing these lights. And so even, uh, even before we went to the moon, astronomers were watching particularly certain craters and things. And in fact, uh, allegedly, the Apollo missions targeted uh, many of the places where we had been seeing this um, transient lunar light phenomenon moving around. Astronomers and NASA admit that there is this phenomenon of light on the moon. Now, we would maybe speculate that, yeah, these, these lights are craft moving around on the moon, they're machines. Uh, if the moon is occupied, as, as I suggest in my book, Extraterrestrial Archaeology, the moon is, has space bases on it, there's underground bases. When you watch the movie, 2001, one of the things that happens there is when they do go to the moon in that movie, everything's underground, and, and which is exactly how it would be on the moon. So the, if there are cities and, and bases and... Uh, uh, hangers, shall we say, on the moon and stuff, there would be underground. But even it's been said that the Apollo astronauts uh, had seen things like spaceships lined up on a crater. In theory, that there are places, there are cliffs on the moon where there's deep shadow and they can't, they can't really find uh, the, 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 the end of these, these giant caverns, in a sense. There's a crater also on the moon. Uh, and George Leonard talked about this in his book. Uh, like Don, I also wrote to NASA that I had certain numbers of photos to get, and I was able to get these glossy photos from NASA. One is of this uh, one crater that's, that's a bottomless crater, and it seems to have this like giant, uh, like huge structure-type ladder going down in it. Leonard believed that, and so did Don Wilson of Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon, and, and I, I discuss this in several chapters in my book, Extraterrestrial Archaeology, that the moon may be hollow, and that the, the moon itself, what, particularly what Don Wilson was saying in his books, uh, Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon and stuff, was that the moon was some artificial satellite like the Death Star in, uh, in the Star Wars movies. It was a construct. NASA early on said that, oh, the moon isn't really from the Earth. It, it's not torn from the Earth, as the Pacific Ocean or something like that. They said that the moon was older than the Earth, and it has all these rare metals and, and stuff in the moon, uh, that, and that's why it would be mined. If you had mining drones, and you, you could go around the moon just scooping up moon dirt and getting super valuable uh, aerospace-type metals, too, titanium and chromium and stuff like that. So you well, have this idea that three. you can go inside the moon and that it's, the moon itself is, is not even from our solar system. It's like a giant Death Star that's been brought into orbit around our planet, and it's a special orbit. It's said that uh, by biologists and, and whatnot that life on our planet couldn't exist without the moon. Because of the moon's uh, tidal forces and gravitation, it creates a certain oscillation on the Earth, moving tides, and uh, it's, it's a force that like moves the oceans around and stuff like that. And biologists have said, without that, life as we know it wouldn't have evolved on, on this planet. So here you have the idea that not only is the moon occupied and uh, some kind of space base, and it's the ideal space base to observe our planet, that's for sure, and, uh, and it, 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 whoever could control the moon 
it, it, like Don was saying earlier about like military missions to the moon, setting up some uh, military bases there. Yeah, you could control our planet from the moon. So here you here you go. And then and not only is the moon this giant space base, but it's actually been brought here and put into a special orbit around our planet. And you know what? Many of the other moons in our solar system may be like that too. They may be artificial, and have uh, been been put into orbit where they are. It's thought that the moons of Mars are like that as well. David, let me throw in a quick question here to amplify that. You're suggesting then that moons are not formed through a natural process? They must be artificial, or is this a mixture that maybe we have an artificial moon, maybe Mars does, but Jupiter, Saturn with all those moons? Well, right, I think it would be a mixture. From what I'm getting, and uh, Richard Hoagland uh, and some of these other sites have some really interesting stuff about Ganymede and some of these other moons around uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn and stuff, and they're pretty interesting. They have weird seams on them. Some of them also look artificial. Some of them appear to be lit from the inside, like they're hollow, too. I mean, I've, it, it's certainly uh, totally possible, as far as I'm concerned, that, that some moons are natural, but at the same time, yeah, I, I can certainly believe, in a sense, and I, I'm looking at the evidence, that, yeah, some moons are artificial, and that includes our moon. I, I seem to remember, uh, you talk about the moon possibly being hollow. I seem to remember reading a report of, of some sort of seismic uh, instrumentation that was on the moon, and a, and a fairly sizable meteorite hit the moon, and I, I just can't... Uh, help but <laughs> remember the quote that the moon rang like a bell for three days. Well, actually, you know that, that, that? That, that, happened, that happened in lieu of one of the Apollo uh, missions up there, Chris. The, uh, they had set up seismic detectors on the surface of the moon. Then one of the booster rockets was uh, sent on a trajectory to hit the moon. And yeah, they, that's, right. yeah, you're right, Don. That, yeah, that's what happened. Right, right. They, they crashed it into the moon. And and they said that it rang like a bell, literally for hours. So yeah, that would seem to suggest, if if not hollow, that there is a, a very large hollow cavity within the moon. Yeah, the moon. In my book, Extraterrestrial Archaeology, I have a whole chapter on that, including geology of the moon. And that they found NASA said anyway, and and produced some diagrams that yeah, the the core of the moon was off center. They weren't saying that it was hollow though, but but that, yeah, there was anomalies in the interior of the moon. And then, of course, this thing about the moon vibrating and ringing like a bell. There's a really curious um, Internet video, and it's what Don was talking about before, where, yeah, you, you go to NASA and you want to get a bunch of photos, and, and, and that's, that's something that Americans generally realize, that, that NASA is a public space program. Everything NASA does should be publicly owned. Every photo they take is public domain. Citizens have a right to have film footage and photos of that. You have to pay for some kind of duplication or you know, having some photos sent to you does cost a little bit of money. I had to pay for these photos that NASA sent me. But yeah, they're free to, to use. Uh, what NASA does is, is for the public. But yet, they're very... Uh, Supposedly, everything they do is overt. Uh, they're telling us, you know, they're very transparent. This is what we do. This is where we're going. This is what we found. But yeah, the more you look into NASA, and you find that no, they're very secretive, and uh, they're not transparent. They're not actually, you know, freely giving you the information and and photos. You you can kind of pry it out of them eventually if you're clever enough or persistent. You'll get this stuff. See, there's also, and a lot of people don't realize this too, there is another space program in the United States, and it's a military one. Uh, it, and it's not NASA. They have their own rockets. They and we'll have to get into satellite. the military space program that we don't talk about quite as much and a lot more coming up. We have David Hatcher Childress, author and publisher. Adventures Unlimited Press is the outfit that he runs. We have Don Ecker of the Dark Matters Radio Show. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. (laughs) 
Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. As we continue with our exploration of lunar anomalies with David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker, with Gene and Chris in the Paracast, now, Don, let me ask you a question here. In the previous, well, there, there are a couple of there are a couple of things before you ask me a question. I, w- I want to point out. Okay, sure. Number one, earlier Chris had mentioned a list of lunar events that I had placed uh, up on the Paracast. Basically, what this was and what it was taken from was a NASA report that I found early in my investigations going back to the early 90s from a document called the NASA Technical Report R-277. Now, what this was was a chronological catalog of reported lunar events prepared for NASA and published in 1968, which was obviously a year before the first Apollo landing. Now, at that time, during that period of time, there were a lot of reports in the popular press about anomalous activity that was being observed on the moon. Now, you guys may remember this, and Gene, I know you will. One of the things that was extremely mysterious that was often mentioned in uh, the press and in the media was something called lunar domes. What they basically were, were in fact, just what they sound like, a dome that would pop up sometimes in clusters, multiple clusters of these things on the surface of the moon that could be observed by astronomers through telescopes. And they would be in a, a geographical location for a while then mysteriously disappear and pop up somewhere else. Now, this happened on multiple occasions. And the fact that people had been observing phenomena on the moon caused NASA to basically get together and decide they wanted to have this report conducted for them. Now, the people that put this together were several people. One of them was a a woman by the name of Barbara Middlehurst from the University of Arizona, another guy by the name of J. Lee Burley from Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, the world-famous British astronomer Patrick Moore, and a woman by the name of Barbara Welther from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Now, what they did were go back ultimately through 400 years of lunar observations by world-class astronomers going literally back to the year of 1540 and coming forward. Now, of course, they did not include every event of lunar phenomena that have been observed over all those centuries, but they did pick up a hell of a lot of them. And this thing was published. As a matter of fact, the last sighting that was studied in here went to the year 1967. So during that period of time, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sightings of strange phenomena reported all over the front of the moon or the the side of the moon that we can usually always see. Also included in there 
were not just all the reported events, but also one section that they referred to as anomalous events. Now, of course, they're all anomalous, but these events were, they titled it dubious reports. But still, once again, that's the one thing. The other thing was that the Soviets at that time also were conducting a tremendous amount of of lunar observation. And some of their probes they sent to the far side of the moon, a place that nobody, in fact, had any plans at that time to land on, but they wanted to find out what was happening back there, which would seem to uh, imply, at least as far as I'm concerned, that they very well suspected that something, in fact, may be going on. Now, one more thing that I want to mention is that even after we ultimately beat the Russians going up there, I find it passingly strange because in just about every other endeavor, they would make sure, if for no other reason than national pride, that they would duplicate the feat. The Soviets never, in fact, sent at least publicly that we know about, a manned cosmonaut uh, lunar mission up there, even though they had the technology, the equipment, and the people trained. That was something that I always found also just tremendously odd. You know, Don, there was actually a Soviet mission going to the moon at the same time as Apollo 11, actually. And a lot of people don't know that. But, but yeah, this is what Don is saying. I mean, it, it, it's interesting in that, and it's what I was kind of saying before, that we have the, the overt space program and NASA and their missions and what we see, but apparently there are what we would call secret space missions. And uh, the Russians have probably had secret space missions and maybe even gone to the moon. We don't know. I mean, they, they claim they haven't, but as Don said, yeah, it seems a little unusual that they didn't really do it because they had the technology. They could have done it. But how um, would you how would you hide that, David? I mean, there are oh, well, space you could obser- easily but go, well, yeah, space totally. space observing nations all across the globe. If the Soviets had sent a a rocket up there with uh, live cosmonauts on board, I, I I really think it would be tough to hide something like that. You know, I don't think it would be, and it's what's. What's going on in the moon is, is it, it, all kinds of stuff could be going on there uh, that, you know, we're unaware of. However, along those lines, what you're saying there, I mean, I'll have to say this, that probably what we've, some of the things we've discovered or the Russians discovered uh, that we uh, allegedly uh, keep secret, shall we say, uh, such as the moon's occupied or something like that, these other nations are aware of that, too. And in fact, uh, it's very exciting to me that, the, that China and India and, and Japan, they're going to go to the moon. They're going to send their own space probes up there. And I think that what they find, well, they may keep it secret too. However, for various reasons, they may actually come clean. They may, we may see new photos of the moon. And, uh, and in fact, part of this has to do along these lines is water on the moon. For quite a while, NASA said, oh, there's no water on the moon. It's this dry desert. Then suddenly, in the late 90s, they announced, oh, yeah, there's, there's water on the moon. And then they were quiet about it again. And then suddenly, India sent a space probe to the moon. And they said, oh, we've discovered water on the moon. And then NASA said, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, we discovered na- water on the moon, too, some years ago as well. So it, it's, you, you can't be sure what they're doing. There are places on the planet, even in our country, where there could be secret space uh, bases. Guantanamo Bay could be one. Uh, Diego Garcia. Uh, even Antarctica could be being used to, uh, as a secret space bases and stuff like that. The military itself in our country, the, they use uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California to launch rockets and things like that. There's a guy who's in Britain who's quite famous in the U.K., uh, and what happened was he hacked into the Pentagon computers, and his name is Gary McKinnon, and I've, when I'm in England, he's, this guy's in the newspapers all the time, because he hacked into the Pentagon computers, he was trying to find UFO information, 
And the Pentagon, they realized that he was the one doing this, and they're trying to have him extradited from the U.K. to the United States so he can go to a military court and be sentenced to prison for the rest of his life. David, the we UK have to break in a moment here, but I wanted to ask you very quickly, maybe we'll pursue this in the next segment. As it stands today, they're still fighting extradition, right? Yeah, the British will not extradite him because he has Asperger's syndrome and he lives with his mother. He's a, I mean, he's, he's, he's a, a guy who's, who's kind of an idiot savant or something. He's a computer genius. It's yeah, kind of like not, on let's autism. Let's not forget he also has admitted publicly to smoking a hell of a lot of weed. <laughs> well, here's what they, here's what. I'll tell you what, we'll get into. McKinnon and lots more. We have David Hatcher Childress, Don Ecker with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Have you been sitting on a few great domain name ideas but haven't locked them in for yourself? Good. Now you can buy them through the number one domain name registrar, Namecheap.com, as voted by the top tech blog Lifehacker. Just like the name says, you can buy domains cheap, as low as $2.99. And every new domain comes with WhoisGuard, our special privacy service, free for the first year. Now that you know, it's time to grab those domain names before someone else does. Namecheap.com. Go now. Namecheap.com. Fake Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fake Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fakemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. The American people think they live in a constitutional republic. Land of the free, home of the brave. Right. Just try those lines on the judge when you get a ticket or have to deal with a big bad IRS. Instead, use EscapeHarassment.com. Since 1972, our volunteer group of researchers and educators have successfully taught how to escape tickets by law, and it works. Escape Harassment has three different steps to follow, depending on where you are in the ticket process. Learn how to escape tickets, IRS, or court proceedings before you go to court. For free, three-minute pre-recorded information and FAQs, call this toll-free number, one 877 9009. That's 877 457 9009. Or go to escapeharassment.com and see our money back guarantee. That's escapeharassment.com. Remember, escape harassment works. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG Clubs and Survival Bucks from the Freeze Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to FreezeDryGuy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze Dry Guy Clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy Clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to FreezeDryGuy.com or call 866-404-3663. That's FreezeDryGuy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. 
America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. We have David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. We were talking about this man from Great Britain who hacked the computers in the, the U.S. Pentagon computers, right. Sure, yeah, hacks yeah, the Pentagon Canada. computers. Yeah, with a dial-up modem, I love that. <laughs> and here's, but here's what people ask him. What did he find? He was trying to find UFO information. The main thing that he has ever said that he discovered on the Pentagon computers was a list of Navy officers who were off the planet. And there was a hundred officers who were in this list, this is what he said, and they're not on planet Earth. They're somewhere in space. They're either in a space station, or they're in some uh, vehicle orbiting the Earth, or they're on the moon, or something like that. That's what he alleged. And this is what... And the Pentagon is, is, yeah, they want him to go to prison for the rest of his life for, for hacking into their computers. He's still living with his mom in, in uh, you know, some rural England or something, and this has been going on for years. But anyway, so what he came up with was what we're talking about, that there's a secret space program. And they have craft, they have officers, they launch vehicles, they, they launch satellites, they may have special orbiting vehicles that, that they don't talk about. They're occupied by Navy officers. I mean, we don't know. This is the secret space program. The military does all kinds of stuff like that. They have all kinds of black programs. They have, like at Area 51, they're making special kind of craft. And in fact, that's one of the problems that people have often said, like uh, Bill Casing about uh, the Apollo missions, was he worked for Rocketdyne. He was a rocket scientist. And, you know, he maintained in his books and videos and whatnot that the Apollo missions just didn't happen the way they said. He's looking for problems in their whole scenario of like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to go to the moon, we're, we're going to go past the Van Allen belt, we're going to land a rocket on the moon, and then we're going to take off again. Bill Casey, you know, made a, a point that, yeah, there's something wrong here with what they're saying. Other people, too, have pointed out that when the astronauts were on the moon in the Apollo missions, they have a Hasselblad camera. They only took about 100 photos with their Hasselblad. They couldn't even look through the lens. I mean, it was just a camera on their chest. They went around just clicking. They couldn't even look at a light meter or anything like that. And yet they took basically 100 perfect photos on the moon. And this is what people have often criticized NASA with that is that, the photos are too good. They didn't take any bad photos on the moon. How, you know, how could they do that? And that's why they're... Now, let me ask you, David, you just raised another specter here. Okay, yeah. so if we didn't take them the way they were presented, because they're wearing the space suits, it's hard to use a traditional camera. How were they taken? Did someone else take them? Well, what people like Bill Casing or uh, the British authors who wrote a book called Dark Moon, and we saw that on our website... What, they may, what they're maintaining there is that the, much of the photos were pre-shot. They were taken before they went to the moon, and that the astronauts were basically practicing, in a sense. And in some ways, the astronauts wouldn't have necessarily even known that the, the photos were being faked. They've shown, and in fact, it was in a popular science magazine uh, back in the 80s, that the Soviets had faked certain space photos. They... They more or less proved it, you know, in the magazine as best they could. So here was the allegation that, yes, certain Soviet space photos were, were fake. But were, could the Americans, you know, be doing that too? It doesn't mean we didn't go to the moon that they faked those photos. It, it, we may well have gone to the moon. And, uh, and they have their other photos. But those photos in, in that theory, they're done in Nevada or something like that. And in fact, if you watch the James Bond movie, 
uh, Diamonds Are Forever, that movie is largely about Area 51. And in that movie, there's a scene where at Area 51, they're faking the moon missions. James Bond gets into Area 51 outside of Las Vegas. That's what the movie's all about. It's Sean Connery is James Bond. Suddenly they realize he's in this facility. He's gotten in. And in fact, there's all these Germans working in there with their German accents and stuff like that. They suddenly realize, oh, James Bond is in here. They sound the alarm. James Bond has to escape. He suddenly walks through a door and he's on the moon. And they're filming it. They're faking the moon missions. It's a, it's a whole moon set. Uh, the lunar rovers right there. Uh, one of the Apollo astronauts is lumbering around in his spacesuit, picking up moon rocks, and they're faking the moon missions. And then, but James Bond is walking on the moon, and then they they're like, "Hey, who's that guy? Get him!" And then he jumps into the it's lunar the rover, rover there on their fake set, crashes through the set, and there's a chase in the desert. I mean, so even though that's a that's a fictional film, but and that all happens pretty fast. But what they're, and that's a 1972 movie, by the way. So they're saying, essentially, yeah, you know, don't believe everything that, that Nancy tells you. They're saying they faked it. It's been alleged that Stanley Kubrick, also who did 2001 A Space Odyssey, that part of that was that he also worked for NASA. And that one of his jobs was helping them create fake moon footage. Now, again, I'm not saying we didn't go to the moon. And the, the authors like Dark Moon, the, the British authors there, David Percy and Mary Bennett, they also go to great lengths in their book to say, look, we think that the Americans have been to the moon, but these aren't photos of it. Uh, and that also comes to the thing of how you would go to the moon. When you listen to NASA and uh, watch CNN and all their scientists, you'd think that the only way to go in outer space is to light a giant firecracker under your butt and go into space like Wile E. Coyote or something. And certain people would say, yeah, and of course, aliens have to come here in rockets too, right? You know, anyone who's in the UFO field would know that the part of the enigma of UFOs, whether they're flying discs or cigar-shaped craft or flying triangles or flying diamonds or whatever they are, they're not rockets. They're not jets. They're some kind of electric craft. I mean, they have anti-gravity or whatever that's propelling them. And it's quite possible that NASA, despite the fact that they show us rockets and stuff all the time, that they have craft like that too. And they keep it secret. If they did have craft like that, you would think they could take the craft to the moon and back. And don't, they don't even have to splash down or launch a rocket. I mean, it's all electric. What would be the purpose, David, of keeping that technology secret? Why would they go to such great lengths and expense to use the conventional, you know, liquid fuel rockets uh, and, and solid propellant rockets as opposed to utilizing such, uh, you know, amazing technology? Why, why would they do that? Well, it's a military secret. Uh, the, much of what, much of the technology we have today, particularly aerospace technology, comes from the military. And uh, it's developed uh, during wars or after wars. Uh, it's all part of the military's budget. Uh, these things are secret. Um, it's a kind of a technology that they want to keep a secret. In World War II, there were not helicopters. That helicopters came out at the, you know, in the early 50s. I'll tell you what, we'll get into helicopters, black and otherwise, and our inventions. In our next segment, we have David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack, Attack. of the Rockwell. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes... The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans a galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. 
Attention gardeners, this is an urgent GCN self-reliance update. GCN has just discovered a new bioactive superfood for garden plants, flowers, and herbs. It's called Protogrow, and it's so effective at producing rapid plant growth that it seems to almost force plants to grow like crazy under practically any soil and light conditions. Now, here's the best part for our listeners who garden for self-reliance. Protogrow's unique blend of sea nutrients maximizes mineral uptake and dramatically increases bloom set, creating maximum plant growth in minimum time. Protogrow works by providing geometric keys, which have the capacity to actually unlock the genetic code for nutritional uptake in plants. Protogrow's full-spectrum plant fertility means fruits and vegetables with extraordinary taste and up to 10 times the nutritional value. And if you want to double or triple the potency of herbs or wheatgrass, you can. If you want to grow nutritionalized superfoods with non-hybrids, it's now easy. GCN listeners who want to grow dirt cheap superfoods should visit the Protogrow website at growlikecrazy.com. That's www.growlikecrazy.com or call 877-327-0365. That's 877-327-0365. Big Berkey water filters are in high demand. Storable foods are also in high demand. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has always kept our focus on the Berkey water filter products. But increasingly, our customers have been asking for storable foods. After months of research, BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com now offers great-tasting, long-lasting, storable foods. These ready-to-eat meals are packed in airtight nitrogen pouches. All you do is just add water. And because they're sealed so well, they come with a 25-year shelf life. Combine our Berkey water filters, which are powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water with our storable foods, and you have a winning combination. Remember, we offer free shipping on every order over $50, and GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY today. You know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health. And most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of most alkaline minerals available. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins and acid, helping you to regain your energy and health. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps the body to rid itself of acidic waste increases oxygen, and raises the pH of your body to optimal levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hello, this is John Burroughs, one of the witnesses to the Rendlesham UFO incident. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. This week, the allotment of guests to cover lunar mysteries and lots, lots more secret inventions, presence of E.T., what's going on on the moon? Is there a secret project sending craft back and forth? With David Hatcher Childress, author and publisher, of course, he has Adventures Unlimited Press, and Don Ecker of the Doc Matters radio show, and also he participates in the Powercast forums with Gene and Chris. David, you were discussing the invention of helicopters in the early 50s. How does this relate to everything? During World War II, I mean, they were starting to develop t- helicopters, and they kept it a secret. And, it, and if you watch the, the movie, the Clint Eastwood, Richard Burton movie, uh, where, where Eagles Dare, which, where they go to this Nazi compound during World War II, in that movie, there's a helicopter. And it's, their, it's the new secret weapon of the, of the Nazis. And that's one of the scenes in, in that movie. Now, t- after World War II, and uh, now we all know what a helicopter is. We see them all the time. Even though certain helicopter technology is a secret. It's a military secret. This whole thing in Pakistan now, just in the news recently, of how the Pakistani military allowed Chinese military scientists and stuff like that to look at the tail of this helicopter that they blew up in Pakistan when they uh, raided bin Laden's compound and all that. 
And that's a big deal. This special stealth technology that has to do with that helicopter. And that's just a helicopter, okay? The reason that they would ha keep a lot of this technology secret is, is, is varied. One is, I mean, the military keeps secrets, particularly technology. Uh, they don't want uh, other countries and, and even the, the American public to know all the technology they have, all the capabilities they have, even uh, what kind of spacecraft, shall we say, that they might have, uh, technology to use it. It's a whole game that they're playing, and they're playing around the whole world. Plus, the, our, the whole world's economy right now is based on oil. Oil and all the derivatives of oil, I mean, that is what the world economy is. They keep talking about Texas now. Texas uh, is some kind of... Um, Miracle state where uh, people have jobs and the economy is going well in Texas, supposedly, better than any other state. It's all because of the oil companies there. David, just want to mention one thing here. The surveys show that a lot of those new jobs in Texas, and this is, of course, because the governor, Rick Perry, is running for president now, the new jobs are at McDonald's or at convenience stores for entry-level incomes. It's not just oil and advanced technology. Well, I think that, yeah, you're going to... And you're going to have that in every state where, I mean, there's some new McDonald's or Subway's opening up. And, yeah, you have entry-level jobs that are being created, but it's not enough to sustain our economy. But what really makes Texas different is the oil economy. Look, the whole Bush-Cheney administration was basically two oil company guys running America. And then uh, they started a couple of oil wars, too, which cost trillions of dollars, uh, I mean, that's where all our money's going on. You don't hear about that too much, how we're overspending by trillions of dollars, money we don't have. Yeah, it's, it's money going to the military. And Could you please tell me what stuff. the hell this has to do with lunar phenomena? What this has to do with that is that, uh, is that the, the Americans probably already have secret technology to go back to the moon. And it's not in rockets. It's with a secret technology. There's a really interesting video that you can watch on YouTube. I've watched it a number well, of times. Well, the current administration has also already nixed any idea about going back to the moon or, or much else in any kind of space, manned space exploration. Now, this is one of the things about NASA. Somebody had mentioned some time ago about what's happening with NASA. I believe, Gene, you said something about that. What, I, what, what, what's happening with, with our manned space exploration? If you go back and you look, especially during the first Bush administration, and I'm talking about George Bush Sr., okay, at the time, NASA was being run by Admiral Richard Trulli. Now, Trulli had made a determination that he was going to once again bring NASA back as the most open and also honest federal bureaucracy then around. One of the reasons for that was because NASA was basically caught with their hands in the cookie jar. And what I mean by that, there was a lot of, of clatter that was happening because there was a very small nuclear reactor being developed to use in space exploration, like a miniature nuclear reactor. There were a lot of people extremely upset about that. And as a result, a lot of activists were sending Freedom of Information Act requests to NASA. Now, NASA was caught subverting those Freedom of Information Act requests. They were caught destroying them, mixing them up. They were teaching their middle management how to subvert this. And I might add this was all very illegal. Truly vowed to clean house. And ultimately what happened, he got into a public squabble with then Vice President Quayle. And Bush fired him. Now, who did they bring in to head up NASA? They brought in Dan Golden from TRW, one of the most covert satellite corporations, international corporations in the world. In other words, these guys were working in the military black all the time. Necessarily so because of the kind of technology they were dealing with. But what this meant was NASA was going more and more 
black. The reason for that, Congress kept cutting their budget to the bone. And there was no way they could continue on the path they were on. But the DOD, Department of Defense, came in and started funding a lot of missions. Now, as soon as that happened, that meant that they were working under the auspices of military security. And a lot of long-term NASA employees, guys that had been there from the get-go, were retiring, being let go, whatever, and they were bringing people in from the military and from these corporations like TRW. So by necessity, they, they went black. And one of the results of that, of course, was the joint mission with DOD and the Clementine Space Mission. Now, I, I think that's a hell of a good good point to go there, Gene. Well, you started it. You opened the door, Don Ecker. Go in it just to let you know we're going to have to break in about a minute and a half. So let's start it here and continue in our next segment. We also have some listener questions that queued up. We'll want to get to those. Go ahead, Don. Okay. Clementine was a mission that was officially called the Deep Space Program Science Experiment. Basically, what it was was a DOD mission uh, working in connection with NASA to go back to the moon in 1994, okay, and extensively and entirely rephotograph the moon. Now, not only the moon, there was also a near Earth asteroid that they wanted to uh, also photograph, but unfortunately, the craft, the Clementine craft, experienced some technical difficulties. They ended up deep-sixing that part of the mission. But when they went up there, it carried seven distinct experiments on board. It had a UV visible camera, an infrared camera, a long-wavelength infrared camera, a high-resolution camera. It had two Star Tracker cameras. It had a laser altimeter, uh, a charged particle telescope. I mean, this thing was... uh, was ready to go in all waves. And when it went up there, they photographed close to, not quite, but close to 2 million extremely high-resolution photographs. Now, my question has always been, number one, NASA has maintained since the cessation of the Apollo program that the moon basically had lost interest, not only for NASA but for the public. As a matter of fact, that's something when you ask professional astronomers today, and I have, how often do you do any lunar observation? They don't, okay? They basically see the moon as uninteresting. I'll tell you what, we're going to find out more of what's going on here in our next segment. With Don Ecker and David Hatcher Childress, I'm Gene Steinberg. The the co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see See if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code Night Owl. Use the coupon code Night Owl to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. If you owe the IRS money you can't pay, then listen carefully, because you already know that the problem won't go away by itself. You can get help today from the leading tax expert in the country, Dan Pilla. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. The IRS isn't going to just forget about you. Right now, the IRS is hiring thousands of tax collectors to go after delinquent accounts just like yours. That's why you need to take action today, and I can help. I take a simple but proven approach to solving your tax debt problem. First, I stabilize collections so you don't have to worry about wage and bank levies. Next, I build a detailed plan to get your debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even eliminated. Finally, I work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. So call now for a free consultation. 
Call 1-800-346-6829. Dan Pilla will solve your tax problem guaranteed. He's helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. If you drive for a living, you don't get paid to stop or wait in line. Keep your wheels moving with prepass. Bypass way stations. Fly by port of entry facilities. Stay moving at highway speed while the guy without prepass waits in line. Save time, save money. Call 888-401-PASS to try prepass free. That's 888-401-PASS. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at crossbreedholsters.com. Don't forget, crossbreedholsters.com. Positive results from satisfied customers of heart and body extract continue to pour into our website, hbextract.com. This is Al from New Jersey. One day I saw your ad for heart and body extract, and it mentioned that it would help me with angina, so I decided to order. I figure I had nothing to lose. Heart and body extract supplies your body with everything it needs to balance itself and maintain optimal heart and circulatory health with no negative side effects. I took the formula three times a day as directed, and I kid you not, within four days, my angina pain was completely gone. Order HB Extract by calling 866-295-5305 or online at hbextract.com. That's 866-295-5305 or hbextract.com. I could not believe it actually stopped the pain. Heart and body extract actually works. This is just an amazing product. Even the numbness in my hands is completely gone. Heart and body extract for a long and healthy life. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Phillips listening to the Paracast, and it's as good as it gets, believe me. With Gene and Chris, we explore lunar anomalies and other such things with Don Ecker and David Hatcher Childress. When we broke, Don, you were discussing the fact that astronomers are no longer interested in the moon. Do they think they know everything about it? Absolutely. That's one of the uh, the misconceptions that many in the public have is that the moon is basically uninteresting. We know everything about the moon that there is to know, which is total claptrap. For example, when Apollo was still in, in process and we still had astronauts going up there, do you remember the famous Genesis rock that was uh, brought back to Earth by the astronauts, the rock that was basically older than the, uh, the Earth itself, the, the Genesis rock, which was around 5 billion years old. But what's even more fascinating is that the dirt that it was laying in, they also brought back some of that, and the dirt itself, the lunar soil, I should say, was a billion years older than the Genesis rock. Now, when you stop to think about it in terms of the age of that, I mean, good Lord. David had mentioned earlier about some of the speculation about the moon's origins, about whether it, in fact, had been tethered and brought into orbit. The orbit that the moon is in around the the planet is, in fact, a miraculous Thing. Even though it is moving away from the Earth roughly an inch a year or, or something along those lines, the fact that it's been in the position it's in that has enabled it to exert the gravitational effects, including things like uh, the uh, movements of the ocean, is in fact almost ideal for life to sustain itself here on the planet. 
So there are a tremendous amount of unanswered questions about the moon, not the least, of course, which is the LTP that's been observed for centuries and centuries on it. But the fact is we don't know everything there is to know about the moon. And uh, the fact that not only the Japanese, but the Indians and the Chinese all want to go there, it's going to be fascinating after we basically, we, the United States, said we're not going to go back, it's going to be fascinating to see what, in fact, develops from that, if, in fact, the Chinese, Indians, or Japanese get up there. Well, you know, Don, uh, I mean, that's such a good point. And I think, you know, what I'm sort of harping on here is that, yeah, this is disinformation, and which is what you're saying, too. The idea that we're not interested in the moon, that we're not going back there, that uh, we'll just let these other guys go there. There's something wrong with that, and and if anything, we we are on the moon. We're we are there now. We we have a space program, and it's well, it's top secret. Maybe we have bases on the moon. Right now, I'm looking at a fascinating website called thelivingmoon.com, and on it are these photos that are pretty amazing of the Aristarchus crater. And they're taken uh, by uh, some astronomers in the United Kingdom. I would uh, encourage uh, your listeners to go to livingmoon.com and uh, look at some of the photos that are here. At the Aristarchus crater is what appears to be this dome there that's lit, and it has a blue glow on it. And there's some good close-ups of this thing. This It looks like some kind of facility on the moon uh, with, with like glass domes. There's some kind of energy there. It looks like, uh, what is, like a lit city in this crater. Now, we might say, okay, uh, these, are, these are the aliens. Uh, they've been there for, for you know, millions of years, billions, whatever. This is their city. We've seen it. Uh, they sent their craft to warn us off the moon. Whatever. I mean, and then those are all interesting theories. On the other hand, maybe this uh, blue lit city and the, the photos are, are pretty amazing of it. Maybe it's actually occupied by the U.S. military. And, and maybe it's a joint base with, with Russians, for all we know. You know, this is the, the allegations of the secret space program. So on one hand, they're saying like, oh, no, we can't go to the moon. We don't even have a rocket now to go there anymore. We haven't for decades. Uh, we can't afford to go to the moon. Uh, well, yeah, let's let the Japanese and Chinese, they'll, they'll go to the moon. Let them spend the money. Uh, we'll, we'll look at their photos when they come back. But apparently, yeah, there's, there's something going on on well, the moon. David, David, when you mention the, uh, the living moon, you've got to also caution the listening audience that there's been a tremendous, and when I say tremendous, I'm talking about a bucket full of disinformation that's come out with that. One of the people involved with that is longtime UFO researcher John Lear. Now, Lear is one of the people... Oh, boy. Lear is one of the people that... He is associated with that side. You're right, yeah. Yeah, a a hell of a lot of of disinformation about the aliens have a quote-unquote soul catcher up there. Okay, in the vicinity of this lit area. Now, what the hell is a soul catcher? This is some of the crap that's been out there, that when you die, your soul leaves the body and it's scooped up. I mean, this is one of the things that bastardizes this research. Okay, you got to be willing to sweep the garbage out. And there's a tremendous a lot of garbage out there. I agree. And, it, and, you know, that's kind of the thing with all these sites and, and including what we the information we get from NASA or, or these whistleblowers and whatever is that, yeah, there, there's disinformation in there, along with a few little tasty nuggets of. But how of many something. how many in the audience have the patience or the knowledge to sort through that and and pick the nuggets out of the crap? Because the Paracast audience is a lot, don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. They the just Paracast. need to keep listening to the Paracast, and then they'll get informed, right? You're you're absolutely correct about that. But but my point is, there's a lot more people out there with an interest 
in these topics than just simply the people on the Paracast. And they go to a lot of other forums where they're not nearly as discriminating. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, being and you know, and this is kind of Richard a, Hogan. being being informed uh, is is what you need to hopefully be, and and that's not easy. It it means reading these books, uh, going to these websites, doing some original research, thinking outside the box as well. Uh, there's a lot of weird stuff. There is this. There's a YouTube video that's well worth watching, and I've seen it a number of times, and. It, it purports to be Apollo astronauts on the moon, and they're going through a derelict spacecraft. Uh, there, you can see they go inside um, this Are structure. Are you talking about the Apollo 20 mission? What's called the Apollo 20 mission, and they encounter a, uh, a female extraterrestrial body there? Is that what that, you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, well, no, you know, that's a newer one, and that is, that's kind of coming out with this movie that's being made right. But this YouTube video has been up there for a good six, seven years. Well, my question is simple, David, when, when that kind of stuff comes out, okay? It's, it's very simple. If, in fact, it's legitimate, and believe me, I don't think it is. I know what you're talking about. But if it is legitimate, do you really believe that the powers that be would allow that to be up there? I don't. You know, I, these are the kind of things, yeah, that, that leak out, that they don't want. The, the British writers of Dark Moon, their subtitle of their book was Apollo and the Whistleblowers. They maintained throughout their book that within the Apollo program, there were people who were working on it who were purposely putting in anomalies and, and, and putting things in that people would notice, that they would see that it was a fake, that, that, that you know, they were part of this, what they believed was this, this elaborate hoax, but that there were people within it working on the project who were trying to sabotage it, trying to bring, uh, you, you know, the, the stories out of what was really going on. And so we might have, in a sense, some of this footage leaks from NASA. They don't want it to be. And then, of course, what you're saying, Don, is that uh, when little things like this do get out, let, let's say these fascinating photos on the livingmoon.com, I mean, these are interesting. But then they have to create some spin on it that makes it sound ridiculous and stupid, like this soul catcher thing you're, you're mentioning. I'll and, tell you what, you know, before we get any more spin control out there, we have another kind of spin that has to be coming our way. We have David Hatcher Childress of the Adventures Unlimited Press and author of zillions of books. We have Don Ecker, the prolific writer himself and the host of the Dark Matters radio show. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in Paracast. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stock brokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. This is one of the shows where Chris and I can be the flies on the wall and just let David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker. Do I hear a buzz in the background? I'm actually flying around. I'm not on the wall. Okay, much, so you're half fly. You, you went guys? into that machine that they had in the movie The Fly to 
transport yourself. And it's not like the teleportation device in Star Trek. It didn't work, wasn't perfected. You're part fly, 90% human, part fly on the wall. <laughs> Your brindle fly. You know, one subject we mentioned earlier when we're talking about people who are somewhat controversial, Richard Hoagland comes to mind. I know we've talked about him before, David Hatcher, Childress, but Don Eckert, what's your take on Richard Hoagland? Well, I've known Hoagland since basically the late 80s. And when you're talking about the moon, there's a an incident that I've relayed before in other venues. I'll give it out here once again. But I had mentioned earlier in the show uh, Jim Sylvan, who was uh, a longtime lunar researcher, somebody that was following very closely in the footsteps of what George Leonard did back in the 70s. And um, Jim was a guest on my old radio show, UFOs Tonight. Now, when Jim was on there after the show, and like I, I had mentioned at the time, he was living out here on the West Coast. Uh, we were fairly close to each other. We became friends. And uh, he came to me one time because at that time I was the director of research for UFO magazine. And at that time... We were basically the magazine of record uh, because of the, the type of work that we were doing. And everybody came to UFO magazine then at one point or another. And uh, Jim said, uh, Don, he said, you know, he said, I read Hoagland's book, The Monuments of Mars. I was very impressed with uh, his work in that. Do you know him? And I said, yes, I do. He said, well, he said, you know, I've never seen him say anything about moon research. And because of what he did with the uh, Cydonium Mars face, I'd like to send him some material and uh, have him take a look at it. Would, uh, would you make that possible? So I said, sure, I'd be happy to do it. Well, subsequently, Jim put together a big package of material for Hoagland, sent it off to him, and then waited and never heard a word back either pro, con, or anything else, from Hoagland. However, roughly six, seven months later, suddenly Dick Hoagland discovered the moon. Do you remember the uh, obelisk or tower or uh, whatever it was that uh, Hoagland came out and made quite a splash? It was that glass, giant glass tower or something, yeah, on the moon. Yeah, right, right exactly, exactly. And... Uh, I really wasn't paying a heck of a lot of attention as far as Jim was concerned. So the next time he came back on, and of course I was aware of what, what Hoagland had done, uh, and I kind of thought that they, in fact, had gotten together. So I asked him, I said, well, how did that go with uh, you sending that material on to Hoagland? He said, well, I never heard back from him. And I said, well, Jim, are you aware that uh, he's now out there talking about this, uh, this glass tower or whatever it was that he suddenly discovered on the moon? He said, yeah. He said, it's kind of funny, isn't it? After I sent him that, that big package of material and photographs, uh, suddenly this happened. So I did not find that unusual because there were a number of other people that have claimed the same type of... Uh, uh, reaction when they uh, would send stuff to Dick. Dick would not acknowledge them, and suddenly Dick was on to that particular pony. So There's a word, there's a word that for that, Don. I'm Don, sorry? There's a word for that. It's called plagiarism. Oh, okay. Well, you see, now this is another reason I come on the uh, Paracast. I learn new words sometimes. So <laughs> Those things happen. Listen, guys, you know, we have a bunch of questions in the queue Yeah, from listeners. We do. Uh, how about this one? Uh, there's quite a number of people that were very taken with the work of Alan Sturm. And uh, he left a very enigmatic message as he dropped completely off the face of the planet. And nobody's really heard from him since. And I think the message was something like, follow the white rabbit. Do either of our guests uh, want to comment on the work of Alan Sturm? And could possibly the follow the white rabbit comment be construed to say you should be looking down the tunnel and maybe be going underground. What, what do you guys think? 
Well, I, I'll tell you from my perspective, uh, I knew Alan Sturm. I had Alan on Dark Matters Radio. As a matter of fact, it was uh, a very good show uh, when when he came on. He was basically at that time at the end or coming close to the end of his public research. And there were a number of reasons for that. Number one, he was going through some extremely uh, arduous economic problems uh, because of his and, and, you know, going down the rabbit hole, if you will. When he first got on to the lunar question, uh, he became like many people do when they get into these esoteric topics and subjects, consumed with it. And he was not making any money at it. His wife ultimately ended up leaving him and divorcing him. Because of the economic problems, his, his uh, home was uh, taken away from him. And basically, the other thing was, as he told me, all the crazies that were going after him, he ultimately threw up his hands in the air brought his website down, left that message up there about following the white rabbit, I assume, down the hole, and uh, disappeared. I tried to contact Alan uh, to bring him back on the show because, quite frankly, I was was concerned about him. And uh, I was curious as to what, if anything, he was doing. And he never got back to me. I I had a cell phone number for him. I tried calling it a number of times, and... uh, that was it. He just basically said, I've had it, and disappeared. Well, what was his uh, – he, he spent uh, quite a considerable amount of time, if I remember correctly, you know, laboriously pouring over lunar photographs. Did he have any particular theories uh, that were, uh, let's say, out of the box or uh, beyond the pale? I mean, what, what was the actual you know, thrust of his work? Well, the thrust of his work was he documented, obviously, and he got these, I might add, from the University of Arizona at a uh, lunar archive there. He had met one of the curators, became uh, friends with them. They, in fact, allowed him to go through these archives, and uh, he found some absolutely, in my opinion, uh, ironclad examples of artificial objects, phenomena on there. Some of this stuff was truly mind-boggling. And he was basically, he ended up putting together a PDF book that he was letting go for a song. He was basically, he was asking for donations, just $5, if, if I recall correctly. And uh, people would uh, would get a copy of this book and not giving a damn about the Sturm himself would pass it around all their friends and relations, and uh, the guy the guy lost his shirt with it. So you know, uh, he 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 finally just had enough and uh, said, you know, uh, boy, am I sorry I got off on this tangent? Uh, it cost me my home, it cost me my wife, it almost cost me my sanity. I'm out of here. And, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, I can, I can pretty much identify with that. And, uh, you know, I know, seriously, I, I wish. Yeah, I, I know you're serious. I wish Ooh, him I the best. I think that to a greater or lesser extent, we all can, uh, not, you know, speaking for everybody. Uh, well, you know, it comes with the territory. You can't get too obsessed. You have to be grounded. You have to have, you know, a level-headed perspective when you, when you start discovering things that just, uh, you know, go against uh, everything that you've thought up to that point. I'll tell you what, speaking of being level-headed, we have a lot of level-headed conversation to continue here with David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Paracast. You expect professional service from your doctor, your accountant, and even the girl who takes your morning coffee order. Why not from your domain registrar, too? Namecheap.com provides stellar service with no sneaky upselling. We offer more features and security options for your website than there are ways to order a latte. And new domains come with WhoisGuard to protect your personal info. At Namecheap.com, you can get your domain for as low as $2.99. Now is a great time to get to know Namecheap.com. Neighbors, do you need to bring the final touches to your 
latest podcasts, clean up the soundtrack of that holiday video, mix together a few takes from your last jamming session, process the audio files of the video game you're creating to sound just right. But look no further. Whatever audio-related task you're looking to perform, Amadeus Pro is the tool for you. It's the Swiss Army knife of sound editing. Go to hairersoft.com. H-A-I-R-E-R soft.com. Alan Olson with Midas Resources, senior gold and silver broker since 1978. Over the last 3,000 years, gold has been a storehouse of wealth and has survived nearly 500 paper fiat currencies. Since the 1970s, the fiat U.S. paper dollar has lost over 90% of its purchasing power and is decreasing every day. With the U.S. government that is bent on reckless spending, gold and silver are your only safe havens of protection for your hard-earned paper dollars. Please contact me, Alan Olson, at 1-800-686-2237, extension 127, with your questions or purchases. Let's work together to preserve your assets. 1-800-686-2237, extension 127. Again, 1-800-686-2237, extension 127. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG clubs and survival bucks from the Freeze Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze Dry Guy clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to FreezeDryGuy.com or call 866-404-3663. That's FreezeDryGuy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download. Direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. We go back to the moon. Kind of like Jackie Gleason said back in the TV series, The Honeymooners. To the moon, Alice. Well, we're going to the moon with Don Ecker. And David Hatcher Childress exploring your questions with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Chris, you have some more questions to follow up on. I do. Trained observer, uh, who's been a longtime poster on the uh, forums here at the Paracast, has an interesting question. Given that countries other than the United States have mapped the moon, have you or anyone else, let's uh, throw this one to David, made any attempts to get Japan or India's high resolution images of suspect areas that we've been talking about? Well, no, that's a great idea, and I, I have to admit, no, I, I have not made an effort to get those photos and stuff like that. 
I'm not aware of yet whether they're releasing them. Um, most space programs are, are pretty secret. And what they discover, uh, the photographs, uh, even their technology for going to the moon and, and the cameras and stuff they use, I mean, they tend to keep that, that stuff a secret. India and, and China would as well. And then, just like NASA, I mean, they'll kind of release what they want. Oh, here's some photos of the moon. Here's what we discovered. If there's really is this secret space program and that the uh, moon, say, occupied and our structures, this is something that other governments would be aware of, too. Uh, certainly the Russians, for sure. And, yeah, the Chinese, uh, the Indians. Also, particularly in China and, and in India, the concept of what life's about, uh, Life on planet Earth, uh, the idea of extraterrestrials and life on other planets. Well, on our, in our country, yeah, we have basically our space agencies saying, oh, you know, there's, there's no life out there. There's, we're going to Mars. We can't find, you know, life. Although occasionally they'll say, oh, well, yeah, you know, there's some bacteria or something. However, uh, with say India or something, they may, just as a nation, may be more disposed to say that, Oh, uh, yeah, this is what we found. Uh, it's, a, it's astonishing. There are structures on the moon. Here's photos. Um, they can believe that. In ancient Indian epics, you know, I've often in my books talk about Vamanas and uh, ancient aliens. I'm on the show on the History Channel about ancient aliens. And the idea in ancient Indian epics is that they had spacecraft in ancient times. That's what most Indians believe. They had these things called Vamanas. There are stories within the ancient Indian epics that they went to the moon. So here you have actually a, a fascinating idea that we've not touched on yet, that perhaps the moon is occupied, but it's occupied by humans from the ancient past. Maybe they're up there, uh, they're, they're Hindus even, have their ancient space base that they started uh, 10,000 years ago. We don't know. I mean, I, I can tell you, many Indians and Buddhists and Hindus, yeah, in South Asia, they would totally believe that. How about that? <laughs> yeah, and they, they have cows in space suits wandering around too, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting idea that uh, along these lines that it's been speculated, and Fred Steckling speculated this, also George Leonard, that uh, one of the mysteries in UFOs, and, and uh, you must have maybe written about this in UFO magazine at one point, Don, or something, is that some UFOs go and suck up huge amounts of fresh water. And there are a number of mysteries in Australia and, and Argentina, also up in Canada where all these lakes, people see these UFOs, uh, a hose comes down, they actually take up, you know, thousands and thousands of pure fresh water into these UFOs. Where are they taking it? Why do they want all this water? Oh, yeah, and those, those stories, those stories have, have been coming around and witnesses that have claimed seeing that for a long time. But, you know, I, I do want to comment very briefly on, on one thing. You've, you've mentioned him now several times, Fred St Streckling. Now, i got to tell you, David, I, I've got a copy of his book. I read it, and it's been some time ago that I read it. But his conclusions, no pun intended, are all wet. Streckling was talking about fresh lakes on the moon. He was talking about trees and, and kind of stuff. I mean, some of this mind-boggling direct like John Lear has put out in recent years. Now, where did he come up with those ideas? Well, I'll tell you where he came up with those ideas. He was talking about photographs he saw from the early unmanned lunar missions. Now, during that time, okay, and we're talking about in the mid-60s when the first unmanned missions were going up there to photograph the moon for Apollo, the technology at that time, the cameras would take the photographs, would photographs, photograph strips of the lunar surface as they were in orbit, okay, and they basically ended up making a mosaic. And anybody that's ever seen any of those early lunar photos will know exactly what I'm talking about. You can clearly see the strips and the mosaic of the moon as the craft photographed them. It would develop them on board the spacecraft. The telemetry would then be beamed back to Earth. Now, Streckling's ideas of fresh lakes popping up on the moon, 
okay, came from solution, from the development solution that would pull on some of these photographs. And, of course, that would be beamed back to Earth, too. Now, the people at NASA knew what in the hell that was, okay? It's solution. Streckling didn't. And then you got this dreck about open bodies of water on the moon. Now, if that's the type of research that Streckling conducted at that period of time, and let's also not forget his family, which has carried on after Streckling passed on, are firm proponents of the George Adamski Foundation, one of the great frauds <laughs> and charlatans in UFO history. Okay, Ouch. I don't, uh, I don't place a lot of a lot of stock in in what Streckling had to say. You know what? I, you're right there, Don. That that Fred Streckling was uh, a follower of George Adamski and uh, believed a lot of of what Adamski claimed. It's interesting, we're coming out with a book uh, later this year by the author Joseph uh, P. Farrell, who looks into a lot of the secret technology and whatnot, and it's, it's about Adamski as a disinformation person, uh, looking into his ties, actually, with uh, Nazis and things like that. So it's this book we're coming out with more or less goes along with what you say, that, and, and a lot of it's about Adamski, Although there's more to Adamski than would meet the eye, I think they would say. Stackling believed, yes, that the, uh, that the, the moon was, was occupied. He believed that there were certain craters on the moon. Certain, and, and, in fact, one of the most interesting ones, and um, NASA also uh, wanted the Apollo uh, guys to look at this, is the Silokovsky crater, which is near the south pole of the moon, and it's on the dark side of the moon. That is a really strange-looking crater, and it's got this flat area of it. It looks like it's uh, like a um, like it's some kind of agriculture area. And we'll have to look at agriculture and craters on the moon in our next segment. We have David Hatcher Childress and Don Ecker with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. <laughs> Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Hey, Bill. Pick up line three. It's Brian. Hey, Brian. What's up? Here. Thanks. Hey, Bill, I just received my shipment of the safety net, our full year emergency food system. I can't tell you how great it feels to personally not have to worry anymore, especially with the growing threats to our everyday food supply. Brian, not only are you getting 4,320 nutritionally dense, delicious food servings, but the individual serving price is just $1.43 per meal. It's truly great tasting food at amazing prices. The variety is also a huge bonus, Bill. It's like having access to a full menu of impressive food. Well, it really is a safety net for those worried about the coming food shortages and how their families can Prepare. It's great knowing I'm covered for the future, but I gotta go, Bill, and get all this food unloaded. With scorching heat, devastating U.S. cropland, there's never been a better time to visit safetynetsavings.com. That's safetynetsavings.com. Visit safetynetsavings.com today. If you drive for a living, you don't get paid to stop or wait in line. Keep your wheels moving with prepass. Bypass way stations. Fly by port of entry facilities. Stay moving at highway speed while the guy without prepass waits in line. Save time, save money. Call 888 401 PASS to try prepass free. That's 888 401 PASS. 
Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at crossbreedholsters.com. Don't forget, crossbreedholsters.com. You know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health. And most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of most alkaline minerals available. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins and acid, helping you to regain your energy and health. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps the body to rid itself of acidic waste increases oxygen, and raises the pH of your body to optimal levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the podcast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We have two more segments to explore the lunar mysteries, lunar agriculture. What are we talking about here? David Hatcher, Childress, and Don Ecker with Gene and Chris. Okay, David, when we broke, you were talking about what was described as an agricultural area on well, the far I, I was, side yeah, of the moon. Well, I was talking about the Silakovsky Crater, and sure. I've got several photos of it in my book uh, from NASA. The more you look at that crater... That's strange. That's also the crater where uh, NASA claimed that they found water on the moon and ice. The cover of Steckling's book that we're talking about, Alien Bases on the Moon, the cover was a really interesting NASA photo, which was a, a, a photo of the moon with this glowing cigar-shaped craft with even like some kind of vapor coming off it, and it's moving across the surface of the moon. And it was apparently... Uh, Steckling's favorite photo that he had discovered of the moon, and it's an interesting one, and he put it on the cover of his book. And, uh, you know, as we're, what we're saying here is that, yeah, he believed that these craft, particularly these large cigar-shaped type mother's craft or something, that they were coming to the Earth, sucking up thousands and thousands of gallons of water and taking it to the moon, and, you know, for whatever, so they can mix, you know, drinks at their moon base inside the moon or something, but... Uh, sure, okay. but if we have water on the moon, can't we just build the stuff there rather than have to transport it all that way? Well, it's pretty clear that you know the, the, both the moon and, and Mars, for that matter, uh, don't have apparently you know very large amounts of water. Although Mars might, because a lot of it's maybe ice that's uh, underneath the surface and it's covered with a, a red dust or something. Uh, that's one of the theories coming out. Well, you know, uh, let me just very briefly bust in here about, uh, and this will cover both NASA as well as questions about life out there. One of the things that I've noticed, I have a, or had a very good friend who lived a few miles up the road from me, who had as a neighbor, just two or three houses down from him, a uh, scientist that worked at JPL. And very clearly, and I remember this vividly, Back around 2002, 2003, this guy told my, my friend, my buddy, that uh, they had definitively discovered water on Mars. Now, that's always been a huge, huge question. And even going back to the Viking program in, in the mid-'70s, okay, that was one of the things that everybody was, was asking, is there any water on Mars? And we know now that it's very likely that at least in certain parts of the year, there is actually running water from Mars. And it's believed that the majority of all of this water 
that Mars had once had that ran freely is now basically ice under the surface. So when people ask, does Mars have water? Absolutely. JPL was aware of that. I waited for a long time to hear them make the announcement. Now, why does that matter? It matters because one of the things that NASA has always, always not done was basically give any good PR about itself. One of their mandates is discovering life off-planet, outside the Earth, okay? But yet they had a clear indicator that there was, in fact, a hell of a lot of water on Mars, and it was just recently that they made a very tepid announcement about that. Same thing with the moon. Clementine, the Clementine mission, at the cessation of the mission, they crashed the craft into the south pole of the moon. They found what they then described as a pretty respectable body of water, not liquid, but what would have been a, a fair-sized lake at the south pole of the moon. Okay, ice. Now, one question that nobody has asked. Where in the hell does all this ice and water come from? Apparently, outer space is filled with it, but we never hear about it. Very seldom do we hear about it. What could it be? Well, when you take a look comets, at, this, at Comets the have uh, water. Huh? They have ice. Comets have, have exactly. ice. There's one theory that that's, that's exactly. where water on the planet comes from. Exactly. You're absolutely correct. And it's believed. It, it's not even really known where all the water on this planet came from. A lot of people think that it came from billions of years of icy comets, or at least one of the places it came from was icy comets crashing into our planet as well as the moon. And that's very likely where that ice came from. So, yeah, if we go up there, if we put a base on there, if we want to make rocket fuel and what have you, uh, by distilling water, that's where it's going to come from. We're talking about water, and that's an important building block for life on this planet and probably many others. What about life on the moon? We know here's a question from Pixel Smith. Now, I'm not sure where he gets this information, but I'll, I'll just read his question. We know that bacterium can survive at least 2.5 years on the lunar surface. Apollo 12 brought some back. I, I didn't know that. Do you think there are other bacterium or life forms living there right now? Who was that directed to? Well, either one of you. Uh, well, or both. I, yeah, I mean, I, I can say, sure. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, there's, there is life on the moon. It may not be indigenous life, just like when the Apollo astronauts, I guess, went to the moon, you know, there, there were... There were people on the moon running around, and, and they brought bacteria and, and water with them when they went. Snack bars and everything. Yeah, but, it, you know, and of course, I'm maintaining that, uh, yeah, there, there, there's, there's more going on on the moon than that. And, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a, as I've been talking for the last couple of hours, I'm a firm believer there are, there are bases on the moon. There are dome cities. There are underground facilities there. It's occupied, and it, if it's not occupied by aliens, then it's, been, it's occupied by humans. And maybe, you know, maybe the aliens are, we're, we're the aliens, in fact. Um, it's, what do you think, Don? Well, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm much more, I think, cautious in, uh, in my speculation. Because let's face it, what we're basically doing here is, is we're engaging in a lot of speculation, informed, granted, informed speculation. But I, I obviously don't know. I've never been there. I'd love to go, but never been there. But if you were to ask me about my speculation about whether there have been, at least previously, if not even now, uh, an extraterrestrial presence there, I would uh, would gear toward the side that yeah I, I think it I think there is and and for a lot of reasons not the least of which has been my 20 plus years now of research but a number of people that uh, I have interviewed that that I have uh, great respect for their standpoint uh, one of them being Dr. Carl Wolf now this is something that we have never really discussed on this program, although we have in passing. Uh, Carl Wolf uh, was a, a, a guy, he lives here in Southern California. Uh, he's not 
now engaged in uh, what he did when he was in the Air Force, which was electronics. But back in the mid-60s, when we were first starting to send unmanned probes up there in lieu of the uh, emerging Apollo program, he was an electronics technician with a secret clearance. He was working out of uh, Langley Air Force Base. Now, where's Langley real close to? Or, or what uh, bureaucracy is there? Well, that, that's uh, uh, back where the CIA is headquartered. And when uh, he was there, he received a call from one of his supervisors. There was, at that time, an unmanned mission going on uh, that was sending telemetry back to one facility. And they were printing out these lunar photographs. Apparently, and remember now, we're talking about the 60s, so the technology is not what it was today. One of their printers went down, and he was dispatched over there to uh, take a look to see if he could repair it. He got over there. His uh, security credentials were all checked. Don, you know you talked about this during your last appearance, so we got to kind of move through it here because we only have one segment left. With Don Ecker and David Hatcher Childress, the co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Big Berkey water filters are in high demand. Storable foods are also in high demand. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has always kept our focus on the Berkey water filter products. But increasingly, our customers have been asking for storable foods. After months of research, BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com now offers great-tasting, long-lasting, storable foods. These ready-to-eat meals are packed in airtight nitrogen pouches. All you do is just add water. And because they're sealed so well, they come with a 25-year shelf life. Combine Combine our Berkey water filters, which are powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water with our storable foods, and you have a winning combination. Remember, we offer free shipping on every order over $50, and GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY today. Hi folks, Steve Shank and Babs Rosberg here for eFoods Direct. In August, we're celebrating our 30-year anniversary in the long-term food supply industry. To celebrate the biggest sale ever, our most popular premier one-year food supply for 30% off. That's 30% off of our Freedom Food Supply. You save $536 on each one-year supply. That's lower than 1981 prices. If you ever thought about getting a year's supply of food, now is the time. This whole one-year supply is a balanced selection of foods, and it all fits in the space of a washing machine. You know you need your own food. But time is running out. This 30% off sale for the best food on the planet ends Friday, August 26th. Call 800-250-1857 or go to eFoodsDirect.com slash freedom. This sale ends Friday, August 26th. Call 800-250-1857 or eFoodsDirect.com slash freedom. You can't argue with success. And many people have found great success in fighting back colds and flu viruses with Ali C, the world's best garlic extract. So now, it's time to get even more success with the other great quality natural products from Affinity Health Products. Like C Energy Liquid Vitamins, Lose and Snooze, and the One Day Diet. 
or human growth hormone support, menopause specialist for women, and joint specialist. See these and many other quality Affinity Health products for men and women online at AffinityHealthProducts.com. That's A-F-F-I-N-I-T-Y HealthProducts.com. Or call in your orders at 877-888-7126. That's 1-877-888-7126. Trust your health to the makers of Alley C, the world's best garlic extract. Affinity Health Products, the finest and most innovative natural health products available. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN Great Talk Radio starts here. This is Jim Mosley, editor of Saucer Smear, and I'm here to say a good word or two about the Paracast, which I believe is the gold standard of paranormal radio. Listen to it if you can. Don't forget to write us, news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. We're back with Gene and Chris, David Hatcher, Childress, Don Ecker. Don, this is our final segment, and we may have some more questions to ask. Can you wrap this up real quick before we go on? Absolutely. He discovered that uh, there were a lot of scientists there, not only Americans, but from the way he described it, there were various scientific uh, entities from around the globe. He got back there. He started examining this printer when suddenly the lone airman that was left in there until the machine was repaired turned to Carl and said, we found a base on the moon, which absolutely shocked Carl. And he said, you what? He said, we found a base on the moon. Now, Carl immediately thought that he meant, well, maybe a Russian base or something like that. But no, no, this airman pulled a photograph out and showed him on the far side of the moon, what we refer to as the dark side of the moon, what appeared to be a facility there, buildings, towers, antenna, the whole nine yards. Now, was I there? Absolutely not. Did I see this? No, I did not. Do I believe Carl? Knowing Carl for as long as I have, and I have worked with him over the years, he has absolutely no in- you know, no reason to lie to me about this. And uh, I've always known him to be a truthful guy. So this is one of those anomalies that occasionally pop up. And, uh, hey, you know, take it for what it's worth. But uh, I believed him. Wow. Here's a question from Exodoc, who's a longtime poster on the forum. Um, Gentlemen, yes, what are some of your top pick lunar phenomena, events, or picks? David, why don't you start with that? We've covered well, a few I, already. You know, I, in my book, and there, there's a video, too, of it, uh, Extraterrestrial Archaeology. Yeah, I mean, it, in there, I run through, uh, you know, all kinds of different anomalies and things. What I find probably the most interesting, which I mentioned before, are these cr- things moving around on the moon. And they leave a, a track, a tread behind them. And, uh, I mean, those are NASA photographs of these things. Yeah, and, yeah those are hard uh, to yeah. explain away. Yeah, if you look at those, it, when you look at that, yeah, you, you can see something's going on there. And it's, and things are moving around on the moon, leaving a tread track behind them. NASA admits that. I mean, they say they're just rocks rolling around on the moon. But, I mean, <laughs> uh, in my mind, these are real objects, and uh, they're, they, they are self-propelled going to the moon. The moon, too, well, I believe, is being mined. So, yeah, go ahead, Don. Yeah, well, Don, what would you say? What's your top pick for a, lo- a lunar mystery? What? <laughs> this is going to sound like a tease again, but it's the photograph that I discovered in 1997 that I have yet to release that clearly Ooh. shows artificial uh, an artificial object that was extending through a crater. It was taken and uh, the photograph was taken in September of 66 from this unmanned probe. And you can follow it on the photograph, and this, incidentally, this photograph came from an actual NASA source. It follows from the crater through what goes over a cliff, and you can see this object again extending out of the cliff with an object on the end of this, uh, this uh, artificial. It, it can only be artificial. 
this artificial object. Now, uh, I've been been trying to think of, of some venue to present this uh, this photograph, along with a lot of other material I have, but uh, some venue that would uh, be suitable. Uh, and when I say that, with the maximum exposure. So I, I've been uh, I've been very tentative about just willy nilly presenting this thing because how about I, a few hints or samples to tantalize us, Don? <laughs> you know, one or two. That's all. We can post it on our forums. We can get a really good link there for you to put up, and then you know later on you want to put more up. That's fine, but just something to whet their appetites. Yeah, chum the waters. Yeah, chum the waters. I, I would have to uh, I would have to think about this okay, long sure. part before I do. We have another question left, Chris. Yeah, there's uh, and this is a question that, that I have as well. And basically, it's it's how can we get NASA to release all those photos from Apollo, Clementine, and other missions? But one thing I want to ask, uh, David, you and I both heard a very interesting story involving Tom Bearden. This story involves uh, microwaving excess energy from the power grid here in North America to the moon. you want to briefly give us a little summation on that? That's, that's always intrigued me. Yeah, right. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this, Don. Um, but, uh, yeah, Tom Bearden uh, and, and uh, uh, his friend Farnsworth, who was the grandson of Philip Farnsworth, who invented the television, live in Huntsville, Alabama. And, and Tom Bearden's... You know, famous for being a 